so everybody can hear and we're recording for everyone who couldn't be here. Okay. Gosh, well, okay, you can pick it up. <laughs> okay. There you go. All right. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Schmidt Boger Joan History Museum. My name is Mary Zara, I'm the executive director here, and I welcome you to our first town hall talk this year. And as many of you know, this is the Historical Society's 50th anniversary. So in honor of the 50th anniversary, we're hosting this panel discussion tonight about the 1970s. The Historical Society was founded in 1972, and so we want to find out what it was like to grow up or to live in Boca in the 1970s. So that's about tonight. But I want to move forward a little bit. We have um, our 50th Jubilee celebration coming up on October 26th at the Addison. The, I have some invitations up here. We've been emailing them out. We would love for you all to come. We're going to celebrate 50 years of Boca Raton's history. We're going to have decade-inspired rooms, decade-inspired food, decade-inspired cocktails, decor, and the whole thing all over the Addison. We have the whole site. And please come and celebrate with us. It's really a true celebration of Boca Raton's more recent history, 50 years. So that's on October the 26th. And then future talks that we have coming up. Um, on November the 9th, our next town hall talk, we're going to be featuring, featuring, and the flyer is in your seat, an Afghan <coughs> poet who was here at FAU on a fellowship. He and his wife fled Afghanistan last year. He is well known. He has been acclaimed in Iran, Afghanistan, and other places. He's going to come to a poetry reading and talk about life in Afghanistan and why they left and those kinds of things. So it should be quite interesting culturally. And the um, Hellenic, Cultural, Hellenic Cultural Society of Boca Raton is going to sponsor that. Then on November 17th, we have a town hall tea time, which is our afternoon event. And this one is featuring Sally Ling, who is an author and has written many books, fiction, about Boca Raton. And um, there, this one's going to be about mysteries, Boca Raton mysteries. And she's very entertaining, but that will be on November 17th at 2 o'clock. And then on December 1st, and I'm not going beyond December 1st, I promise, um, Bob Carr, who is, quote, Florida's archaeologist and who has done the excavation at um, the Ocean Strand property is going to come talk to us about his different um, projects in South Florida. He has done the work at the Miami Circle and at the Cutler, what is it called, the Cutler? Cutler site. Cutler site. The Deering Estate. Near the Deering Estate. And um, he also did some work at the Barnhill Mound here in Boca Raton. He's going to be very interesting. And then our new exhibit starting in January is going to be Mid-Century Modern Architecture in Boca Raton, the 50s and 60s. We're going to feature the architecture of Howard McCall, who is our wonderful, wonderful Howard that we all love, who was a prolific architect here during that time. And you will see buildings we see every day that he designed. And we are quite a mid-century modern town, as you will find out. Um, in your seat, you have not only the flyer on the Afghan poet, but you have a couple other things. One is a membership form. And if you are not a member, please join. We are collecting and preserving and sharing Boca Raton's history every day. And most of you are Boca Raton residents for a long, long time. And we are preserving your history for your children, and we really would like for you to be a member. And secondly, we have a survey in your seat, and we are required by the county to do these surveys. And we get a very generous grant from the county every year, and this is a requirement for us. Please fill out a survey for us. We have a quota we have to meet. And we only do it every other year, and this is our year. So please help us out. So thank you very much. And second, next, I'd like to introduce Susan Gillis, our curator, who has put this talk together. And um, Sue is going to introduce the panel, and she's going to be the moderator. And we're going to learn a lot about the 1970s. Okay. Thank you. I guess you need that. Okay, everybody, thank you for coming tonight. And I see some longtime residents. 
I don't like the term old timer. <laughs> in the front row, they're going to be able to advise us on their own personal memories of the 70s in Boca Raton. Uh, so our uh, format tonight is kind of simple. Um, I'm going to introduce these gentlemen, let them tell you a little bit about themselves and why they know anything about the era here. Uh, and then we're going to, I have some questions to throw out to them about what was going on here in the 1970s, how times, how the uh, city <coughs> changed during that era. Um, and we also, um, I, you know, we welcome questions. If you all have some specific questions or some memories you want to jog, I think it'll be a lot of fun, okay? Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jim here. And Jim, share with us a little bit about your association with Boca Raton. Oh, well, first of all, I'm a newbie. I've only been here since 1968 uh, compared to my two compatriots here who essentially, I guess, practically were born here, right? Um, so while I know a lot about what's gone on subsequent to 1968, I don't have any idea what happened, except for a few stories that Buzz can tell. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm a real estate appraiser, so I, not, I know a lot about residential stuff here in the town and how it's grown uh, over the years. Um, it's really an amazing place. And when, we got, when I got here, um, we lived in Royal Oak Hills. That's the first house we bought for $22,000. Thank you. And um, it was uh, a wonderful investment uh, over time because we then moved to, to a Meisner house in Old Floresa in 1972. I call it April Fool's Day, 1972. We lived in that house for practically 30 years. And um, when we decided to sell it, it's a two-story house, and, and uh, our children who were born, essentially born there, said, you can't sell it. I said, we're going to sell it. We're moving to a one-story house. <laughs> and uh, we did, and we uh, bought an old townhouse over on Camino Real and re rehabbed it. So we, it's been a, a fun 20 years there now, as a matter of fact. Uh, but uh, again, my... Uh, my knowledge is only since about 1970 or thereabouts. These guys have been here forever. So I'll let them speak about what they do. <laughs> I'm Remy McLaren, Robert I. McLaren II. Um, I was born and raised here, as Jim says. My grandparents and my father and uncle actually first wintered in Delray in 1917 when. Uh, my father got out of the service, concluding a very distinguished military career that fortunately his, his father, through Paul Rogers, arranged for him to spend in Boca Raton. Um, we lived in my grandparents' house that was on Atlantic Avenue in Delray, where the uh, Bohem Bistro restaurant is today. So you can see how that area has changed. Um, I graduated from Seacrest High School, which was the only high school in the area other than Carver in 1965, left the area, uh, went to undergraduate school at the University of Florida, and also then returned after a year of working for the legislature to the law school there. And then in 74, my wife finally got out of law school, and in 76, we moved back to town here. So, and we've been here ever since. And glad to have been here. <laughs> <coughs> well, I'm uh, Howard E. McCall Jr., and I've been uh, known as Buzz my entire life. Uh, Florida native, born in Vero Beach. Uh, we moved to Boca Raton in 1959 from Lighthouse Point, so we didn't have far, far to come. And uh, as Susan said, my dad was an architect, so we saw this town grow from uh, basically 4th Avenue west. And uh, I still remember my dad coming home uh, for dinner and saying, you never guess, somebody's going to build a house on Fifth Street. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be the last house ever built. Yeah. So I wouldn't say he wasn't a visionary, but he certainly never saw what was what was coming. And uh, his house has kept going further and further west. He said, well, I guess this is really going to happen. Uh, I live here in Boca Raton. I, I must admit, most of my uh, misdeeds were in the 60s when I was uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say growing up as I was getting older <laughs> and uh, went to school with Remy and, and uh, Workman City on the front row. We all went to Seacrest High School and uh, 
I left, I went to Florida State. I, did you say the University of Florida? I went to the Florida State University. And uh, uh, left here in 69, moved to Boston, met my wife, who's here today, tonight. And we moved back here in 1972. Uh, allegedly, I was supposed to be grown up and mature when I came back, but still have a few stories. Uh, but we love living here. Our children live here. Uh, and it's uh, it's been uh, quite an experience to see the town grow. Okay. Well, you can hand the you can add just the mic to me or the stand, okay. whatever is convenient for you guys. There you go. Okay, great. So I want to kick this off with uh, I I have a couple of uh, uh, photos as inspiration. This is an aerial of uh, Boca in 1970 or 71, um, and. Part of our story here is in uh, the IBM comes to town in the late 60s um, to manufacture small mainframe computers, the 360. Uh, and they build this fantastic building where today we call it the Brick Campus, Boca Raton Innovation Campus, uh, way out west and way up north. Uh, and of course, remember the interstate didn't exist back then. Uh, and that was completed in 1970. Um, and Boca Raton is annexing a big chunk of land in 1971. Uh, as you can see, the peach color here, uh, which includes the IBM campus and also University Park, which was originally a, it tried to be its own independent municipality, was founded by Arvida back in the day. Jim may be able to talk about that. Um, but apparently you have to have a fire department to be your own municipality. So <laughs> the, the city decided to annex it then. So my question is this, um, why, why were people coming here in this time period? Um, Harry Cohen, who couldn't be with us today, uh, had a great comment. He said, Sue, I think of the 60s as the, um, the launch of a rocket. We're on a mission to the moon, all right? Uh, and so the 60s are the launch, the first stage. But the 70s is the second stage. So, um, Jim, tell us, all of you gentlemen, tell us a little bit about why people came here, what was the appeal, what the heck was here back then? Well, we came here because my wife, Gail, who's here, <coughs> had moved down here. Her father had retired and they bought a condominium in the San Remo, which is up on North Ocean Boulevard. And uh, I spent a year in Vietnam and uh, came back and uh, we had our car and our dog and our stuff. <laughs> and uh, I'd, gra I'd graduated from college. I had a job with Liberty Mutual before I got drafted in New Jersey. And I could have gone back there, but we spent uh, a year in Texas and a year in Vietnam. And she was here for a year and we stayed. We went back up there, looked around, and said, nah, let's go back to Florida. So we did. And uh, it was a, just a fluke. There was no reason other than the fact that we like we hate winters in New Jersey, and um, we liked the warm weather, and it was it was a fun place to live. We lived in, as I told you earlier, in, in Royal Oak Hills. We were what, by far, without a doubt, the youngest people in the neighborhood by hundreds of years. <laughs> <clears throat> we had our first child, and. We invi invited the neighbors to come over and look at a child. <laughs> and anyway, it was so it was wonderful place. And um, and then in 1970 or thereabouts, we there we were about we didn't know anybody. Uh, but about 1970, we met, we met some younger folks like us, and it, it just blossomed from that into a whole bunch of people who were more in our age bracket than had been here before, I pretty much think, um, except for these guys who were forever, forever. Um, anyway, that's my recollection of that. Specifically to respond to Susan's question, people came here for the same reason everyone comes here and the reason we all stay here. Uh, my wife, when she got out of law school, we said, we can go any place in the world. And we'd been a number of places, and we said, God, there'd be no better place in the world to go 
than back home to the Delray Boca Raton area. We just, even with the, that experience, unlike a lot of people say, gosh, the last thing I ever want to do is go back there. But we just thought it was paradise from the time we were kids. I'm not sure she says that, but it was certainly paradise and, and remains that way. Um, in 1970, when we're talking about this <clears throat> beginning of this, this era, uh, we, my wife and I looked at the Boca Raton News for 2 January 1970, to put it all in perspective. Jim bought his house for a bargain price. Whitehall of Boca was just under construction on 2000 South Ocean, and they were advertising two and three bedroom units starting at $38,750. The lighting gallery was about to open on North Federal, and at Winn-Dixie, New York Strip Steak cost $1.59 a pound, and most importantly, we will all remember this, a six pack of Bush Bavarian was 99 cents. <laughs> <laughs> the 7-Eleven on Wana Road, I'm, I was surprised that it was in existence because that was way, way out in the sticks at the end of 12th Avenue. Uh, they were advertising for store clerks and they were going to pay $93.50 a week for a six day work week. <laughs> The estimated population, then Brownie, was, Brown, Hugh Brown was the chief of police. He had been the chief of police here since my dad was a child. My father used to say when they would go helling around driving about as fast as a car would go at the time down to Fort Lauderdale, Brownie was the only policeman here, so we'd stand out on Federal Highway and just wave them on, you know, tell them to go on. <laughs> uh, his wife actually taught school at Plumosa up in Delray, and his, one of his daughters was in our high school class. But he had a bet with the uh, planning and zoning director as to what the population would turn out to be when the census came in in 1970. And Brownie had bet 35,000 and the, the uh, zoning director had said 28,5 and it turned out to be uh, the zoning director was about right. That had been an increase from the previous decade and the 60s probably were the greatest growth generation in Boca Raton. It changed from a small, sleepy little seasonal town, attracted by the hotel and club and some people that would support the community with 6,961 full-time residents in 1960. At the end of the decade, there were uh, 28,500 people there. That was tremendous growth. And then in the following decade, the one we're speaking of in, 20, in uh, 1980, the grow, uh, population was 49,447. Interestingly, consistent with Bud's comment about the former FSCW school. Uh, an editorial in the Boca News criticized the manner in which Ray Graves resigned as the head football coach at the University of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> that was a time when the war there was a war raging in the world and Nixon was uncovering, they were uncovering certain things in Nixon and the idea that just shows how important that was. Now, there were a lot of things about that. Stephen C. O'Connell had come to University of Florida in 1967 from the Florida Supreme Court to be the president of the university. That summer, he had gone to North Carolina and played golf with Doug Dickey, who was the head coach at Tennessee, convinced him to come back to Florida. But And so Graves resigned, even though he didn't want to, because his 69 team was the best he ever had. And then Dickey was waffling on coming or not, and that's why he had to say he wasn't coming. So the editorial didn't know everything. The polo season was about to begin. That was really an exciting thing in Boca Raton at the time. The following Sunday, 4 January, it was going to start, and uh, John Oxley was going to play for Russell Firestone Jr.'s team. The polo grounds were located where uh, Lynn Insurance Group is now. <clears throat> Originally, they had been where the Royal Palm Yacht and Country Club community is. There was a there was a many bowling leagues at the University Bowl, uh, which is now the Chamber of Commerce, on Dixie Highway. Boca Raton Academy was founded that year. Emil Dansu was mayor, and later that year he ran for the state senate on the Republican uh, in the Rep Republican primary. And uh, my Sunday school teacher, Bill James, actually won the primary, and then they lost to the Democrat from Fort Myers. Uh, Boca Raton Convalescent Center opened for the just unbelievable construction cost of $1,250,000. <laughs> Owen Benson was the tax collector. 
and he had to be rushed to the hospital with a heart attack because he had been assessing things based on sales price and the citizens were protesting him and his wife uh, wanted everyone to know that their actions had caused him to have to be in the hospital. <laughs> and uh, based on the sales price that he had used, many people's assessment, not their tax, but their assessment went up 21%. And so the city council actually passed a resolution limiting the amount of the increase in the assessment to 10%, which was illegal, but they did it anyway. <laughs> the hotel and club back then, well into the, as I recall, the 80s, would close for the summer. It was a seasonal operation. You could buy a 1970 Mustang from King Toyota in Deerfield for $2,399. And that day, the Dow closed 686.68. Johnson and uh, Yesford Realty, located just south of uh, Palmetto Park Road on Federal Highway, had two houses for sale in Royal Palm, a 3-2 for 80000 and another 3-2 for 87005 on Queen Pond Road. That was the 70s, the beginning of the decade. From that, everything took off again. walk through memory lane. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, to sort of quote my dad, um, he came home one day and dinner, he said, all these people moving to Royal Palm and, and uh, you know, building really nice homes and, and uh, they're all coming down from New York. And, boy, it's really strange. They're all coming from the same town. So where's that? He says, Armont, New York. And uh, I said, hmm. So we, we did a little, we didn't have Google then, but we did a little checking. <laughs> And sure enough, these were the sort of the, the guys that were scouting out the area for IBM. And um, IBM obviously was built uh, on, on uh, Yamato. Ironically, my office is on that campus right now. And a long time ago, you'd, you'd drive out, down, it was a two-lane road, and you'd look over to the south side, you couldn't see anything. It was all bushes. They, they really camouflaged uh, IBM quite well. And, I, and again, to look at that building that was built in the late no, late 60s, I mean, that building, and 70. That building and is phenomenal. I was in it yeah. uh, the other day, and I mean, it has really stood the test of time. You may not like the architecture, but that thing's a bomb shelter, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, you know, why do people come here? You know, I left, and um, just as a side story, uh, my wife and I lived in Boston, and I was a stockbroker. And I sat next to William Mind at the sixth, and there was uh, another proper Bostonian on the other side. And, and, you know, I was working my tail off, and I was really not getting anywhere. We'd go to lunch, and these guys would come back, and they'd have a big stack of sales tickets, and they never made a call. But they were, you know, the Harvard uh, endowment, and, and, and this school, and that school. And I was pulling my hair out, and Bill Mind at the sixth said to me, you're never going to make it here. You need to go where you're known. So it just so happened to coincide with January and we're going to the end of town. We lived up in Beverly and it was like minus six degrees. And my neighbor said, why are we living here? So I went home and, and uh, Pat and I, and actually the, our next door neighbors came down to Florida in the middle of the winter. And Pat said, we're not going back there, are we? <laughs> so sure enough, we moved here uh, that summer and uh, our next door neighbor uh, over on uh, 9th Street was Tom Fleming. And Tom was uh, head of First Bank and Trust. And, and uh, of course, he you know, knew me since a little kid. So I, I came to work for Rental Securities uh, over on 150 Palmetto Park Road and, and setting up shop. And one day I get this call for, from Mr. Fleming that he wanted to see me. So I went up to the second floor. And he took me into the boardroom. So they had the most beautiful table. I don't know what happened to this beautiful Cypress table that was three miles long. And so I, I pulled up a seat. He said, no, you come sit up here next to me. <laughs> so there was Tom Fleming, myself, and he brings all these people in from the bank. And he says to the trust officers and this guy and that guy, he says, this guy right here, you send your business to him. So <laughs> I always call Bill Miner and I said, you were right. So I came back and Pat and I came back because we needed to come back to our home where we were known and uh, 
you know, we, we had uh, a lot of family roots here. Uh, even my sister lived in Fort Lauderdale, but we were all here. My brother lived here. So we really came back home. And, uh, but back to the IBM story, I would, and when I was a stockbroker, I'd say there were 20, 30 people in that office. And to my knowledge, only two people that were from here. Uh, Bill Hood was from this area, and Dennis Ferguson was from this area. Everybody else was from somewhere else. And in 1971, 72, how did these guys get here? Well, you know, they're not, they weren't dummies. They'd look at the weather report and said, I'm going there. <laughs> so I, I would say the weather, the taxes, the same things that exist today were the same things that existed in the 70s. It was climate, lifestyle, uh, favorable tax base, and an opportunity to, to build whatever, whether you're an insurance man or a, a stockbroker or, or whatever. This was a, an area that you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out, we're gonna make a, make a living here. So uh, I think all of those were a combination, certainly IBM, I think at one time there were maybe over 50,000 people, it was some Probably. huge number. I don't, I don't know the exact number, it was tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. worked there. Yeah. Uh, in various outlying buildings. Uh, I will give a little side story. Uh, after we lived on 4th Street, northeast, Northwest 4th Street, actually about a block away from the Hackens, we moved out to Boca Bath and Tennis, which used to be a golf course that the uh, Schmidt family, uh, Dick actually developed it uh, with Mike Brennan. We lived in Boca Bath for 20 plus years. And one of our neighbors was Dan Wilkie. And Dan Wilkie uh, became general manager of IBM. And we go to Dolphin games and we go to Strikers games and our kids grew up together and he never ever talked about business. And one day they announced the personal computer and he said, well, yeah, we've been working on that for a bunch of years. I said, don't you think maybe you could have given me a little bit of a tip <laughs> <laughs> to buy, you know, one of the vendors to IBM. I'd say all the credit to Danny, never said a word never said a word. And across the street from us was um, Don Estridge, uh, lived across the street or in the area, and we all know the tragedy that hit uh, that family. So uh, again, a combination of IBM bringing thousands of people and weather and taxes mm -hmm. and a great lifestyle, that's, that really kicked it all off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so here's just for fun, picture of IBM under construction. <laughs> IBM under construction. Um, so this sort of leads me to, uh, let me find it. <laughs> ah, the elephant in the room. Uh -oh. <laughs> so all this growth, isn't that great? But not everybody thought it was great. So <laughs> local citizens decided to pass a growth cap on dwelling units, 40,000. Now, former mayor Steve Abrams paid us a visit recently, and he said, Sue, we just hit that. This is within the city limits. So tell us what you guys remember about the growth cap and what happened to the growth cap. I'll be honest with you. I don't remember an awful lot about it at all. I, I thought it was ridiculous. Uh, as a real estate person, naturally, you don't want to have, you, want to have, uh, um, you know, uh, inhibit the, the uh, growth in the, in, the, in the neighborhood. And the growth was going pretty well. Most of the, Big properties were owned by Arvida. Uh, we've luckily, uh, because there's a lot of towns around Boca Raton that are just scattershot developer builders. <clears throat> At least Arvida had big projects. They had obviously Boca West, Estancia Paseos, um, Estancia West, and they had Mill Pond and Timber Creek and all that. It, it was a lot of property that they owned and developed very nicely. Um, so, uh, again, I don't remember much, much about it. I, I do remember the, the, the proposal for the cap. I don't remember how it ended up. I know that we did, ultimately, we outgrew it and uh, got through it, and we are what we are today, which is, compared to many 
communities that I've been in in South Florida, pretty nice. You drive down to Fort Lauderdale or Miami or yeah. Pompano Beach or whatever and come back to Palmetto Park Road or Glaze Road, whatever you, wherever you get off 95, it's pretty nice coming into Boca Raton. <laughs> The growth cap was the work or the product uh, of the Citizens for Responsible Growth. That was led by Dorothy Wilkin, uh, unsuccessful with the cap, but successful with her political career, because that was a springboard to become council member, mayor, member of the county commission, and then retired to Delray Beach as the uh, clerk of the circuit court. And the way the growth cap was structured, and that was its, its deficiency, is, and Dorothy had said, we can't stop them from having babies, but we can stop them from having houses. And the limit was 40,000 homes. And that, that was the deficiency in the structure of the growth cap. Tom Becker took it on on behalf of uh, Arvida, and another plaintiff who I can't recall their name right now. He was a local lawyer that practiced with Bob Tylander, probably one of the first firms. It was Tylander, Declare, Becker, and Van Cleek, and they took up the top floor of the, of the uh, bank and trust building there. Mr. Tylander had been a roommate in, at the University of Florida <laughs> with Tom Fleming. And so he was brought to Boca to represent that first bank and trust at some time in the 60s and then in 1964 the bank had grown to the critical mass where the lawyer had to be in town all the time and so the thailanders moved to boca raton in uh in the judge mcmillan uh ruled in 1977 that the cap was unconstitutional and what it did is it took away property rights it said to somebody that once you hit 40,000 homes, well, if you own some property out here, you, you can't build another house. And that's not the way uh, the Constitution and property rights work in America. It got appealed and it got appealed and it appealed and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And finally, in 1984, the last appellate court said no, that this is unconstitutional. And that was the last we saw the growth cap. Now, what it did do, though, interestingly, is it did exactly the opposite of what it was intended to do. <laughs> because you, at the, the way it was structured, you were limited to 40,000 houses. So what every developer did, particularly Arvida, because Norm, Norm Cortese was the one that said this, is they went out and got as many building permits as they could as quickly as they could, because they were afraid that once they reached the 40,000 limit, they would be precluded from doing any more construction. So it had, again, it had the actually the, the opposite effect of what they had wanted to do. They could have done it as it is now. We limit things in Boca Raton with our zoning restrictions. How <clears throat> thing is, is to density per acre, density per unit, lot coverage, height restriction, and those type of things. Had it been structured differently, they could have achieved the same thing, but, but it wasn't and it's a landmark case in uh, land use regulation and land approvals. Well, if you sat around our dinner table, if you wanted to start a family argument, you mentioned the name Dorothy Wilkins. <laughs> and, uh, both my mother and father would absolutely go nuts because like Jim being in a real estate business, my dad was in the building, a business of designing and building homes. And, um, I, I really don't remember that it was uh, something that held them back. I mean, because they obviously continued to design homes and build homes, and and uh, you know all of these communities flourished. But uh, I do remember that it gave a little pause to to things that allowed uh, our planning and zoning board and uh, community appearance board uh, to really take hold and and to really gain some teeth. And you know, you drive up and down the road now and and still today, there's no car dealerships to speak of in Boca Raton. Uh, <laughs> there's a signage ordinance, uh, on and on and on. So, in a way, um, you know, keeping the town from just totally exploding, it was able to grow at a managed pace and, and with, with a lot of rules and restrictions. 
So like Remy said, in hindsight, it probably didn't work the way Dorothy thought it was gonna work, because it really ended up a beautiful down that uh, was able to take a breath. And uh, I don't remember anybody saying, gee, I can't, I don't have a house, I can't live there. So, um, you know, I used to work for, in the summers I worked for George Snow in construction, and I can promise we, uh, we never stopped. <laughs> busy, busy, busy. Just as an aside, I've forgotten all about Dorothy Wilkins. <laughs> Remember her and husband? <laughs> yes. West. The Green Panther. This awesome article, because you see it's from the New York Times. Uh, in 1973, it says, Rich Boca Raton decides it's time to stop growing, and that gentleman is selling champagne from an ice cream cart at the Polo Beach. <laughs> so if you wonder how Boca got her snooty patootie reputation, <laughs> I think that answers it. Um, so another question that's kind of connected to that is in addition to um, here you go. Real Boca, we have the growth of West Boca. As you can see, this is from 1973. And a lot of these projects are by Arvida. And this is before the interstate was even finished. So Jim, tell us about those the Western provinces, as I like to call them. Well, I can tell you this. I played golf at Boca West in 1972. The only thing out there were two golf courses. Remember all those bridges they built over the water? I mean, these look like, like, like the interstate. <laughs> it was a beautiful place and they had a wooden uh, clubhouse that subsequently has been torn down years ago. And that was it. That was the only thing that was out there. And um, you didn't, nobody went further west than the turnpike it, because if it was it's just a country road, it took you out to Bows you pick, if you remember, or any of those you pick farms out there. And then 441, there was nothing. Sandalfoot Cove was built, I believe, in the like 1967, 68. A guy named Sandy Guterma, who was a developer here in Boca Raton, uh, developed that property a long time ago. Other I than that, it was really, really far west. Oh yeah, that was out of sticks. Nobody, nobody went out there unless you're going to Naples, um, and then even that you couldn't get there from there. But um, it was a, it, it was, it was pretty vacant. Being a local boy, we used to always say nobody should build west of Dixie. <laughs> and when we came home and saw that they were building condominiums out there, God, who knows how far out, you know, we, we didn't even go that far out to hunt quail. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said, who in the world is going to buy these things? Because we had no idea at the time, being raised here and living here all the time, that you didn't have to be on the ocean or the canal to want to come here. Just getting out of that miserable hellhole of the Northeast with the snow <laughs> that would you arm would touch the car and you'd be frozen to it. And I've never experienced that, but I've heard it all my life from people as to why they came. But I didn't appreciate that they would buy something that far west. When I played golf there, back when I played golf before children, it's in, you know genetic with a Scott. Uh, all I remember is you take a swing and then have to beat the mosquitoes off you because that place was just out in the swamp, so it was full of mosquitoes. But of course, uh, we, we didn't have the vision, couldn't see that there was life west of Dixie. <laughs> when uh, Butts Farm was uh, flourishing, uh, maybe Tom even did this, but uh, when there was going to be a freeze, uh, Mr. Fleming used to get a bunch of us to go out there and light the smudge pots to help uh, the crops from freezing over. And uh, again, that was a farm. And, and like Remy said, uh, that was way out west. When I'd have uh, Friends of mine picked me up to drive up to Florida State. They would give me a hard time to get off the turnpike and take this ridiculous route to get into Boca Raton, which uh, there wasn't a straight road coming in here, and they'd laugh and make fun of the hillbilly uh, living in Boca Raton. But uh, I remember one day, um, Fleming's came home and said, well, we sold, literally, we sold the farm. And uh, to what, to, to whom? And 
well, that was obviously Arvida became Boca West. Because that farm was quite large. I'm not quite sure if it went all the way well, to Glenmore. It, it went but, from uh, Butts Road all the way to State Road 7. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a sizable piece of property. We should have more green beans than anybody in the world. Yeah. <laughs> So it was a huge piece of property. I don't remember the exact number, but at the time it sounded like he robbed uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and had all the money in the back of his car. But I think probably there's three lots in Royal Palm that are equal to the price that he got for, for Boca yeah. West from, from Arvida for Butts Farm. Um, yeah, it was uh, like uh, Jim said, to go out to Sandalput Cove Again, why would someone live there? It was so far away. And, uh, but then, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, Boca Grove was uh, literally an orange grove, and one of our classmates, uh, yeah. they lived there. We'd have great parties out by the spillway the police could never, never get to. And, uh, you know, I mean, the place just exploded. And I remember we had a friend um, built a house out in Horseshoe Acres, which was probably even in the 80s. And again, we said, why would somebody live out here? Well, I mean, that's, I don't know where the geographical center of Boca Raton is, but it's out there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Just as another aside, when Remy talked about nothing happens west of Dixie Highway, I met an appraiser down in Pompano, probably in the early 70s, and I said, talk to him about something about Palm Air, I think. He said, what's that? And I said, <laughs> he said, where is it? I said, it's out, you know, it's out there on the other side of the Dixie. He said, nobody goes out there to Dixie, to west, west of Dixie Highway for any reason at all. <laughs> that's fun. Uh, well, I have a little open park story because that's where I'm from. And I do live two blocks west of Dixie. And back in the day, the pioneers say they would build the west of Dixie rather than east of Dixie, which is today the more desirable neighborhood, because when the trains came through, the old steam trains, the engine smoke would blow that well and help kill the mosquitoes. Huh. Oh, now, I don't know if that's true, but everybody thought it was true, and that's an interesting story. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's talk about something we, we have uh, talked around here. Um, Arvida. And um, I have to open up this because I have a really great map here. There you go. Are you going to open? No, no, no. Sorry. There you go. That's okay. Hmm. My technical support. Why was this company so incredibly successful? Probably the most successful real estate firm, certainly in the history of the state of Florida, if not the United States. Jim, that'd be a good question for you, I think. Well, uh, they, they owned all this land and they hired uh, some pretty high, high powerful people to run it. Uh, three or four of these guys were from California. Um, I'm thinking of Shubin and, uh, and Chuck Cobb. Uh, they all had been through the boom in California and they knew how to do it. They knew what they needed. They knew how to, um, there was a guy that, um, was the lead developer for Weston down in, in Port Lauderdale. When he did all of the development work of the, of the entire community, plus conjoining all those roads to come together. If you remember, there was Andy Town, the only way to get across the Alligator Alley. Well, that's long gone, but he got 70, and that 70 turned into West, going over to Naples, and into, into, it's, it was a, just an amazing, huge job. That this guy did, and, and the, they all did that here too. Of course, I I ninety five helped. I remember I talked to a, an old developer guy who's um, can't think of his name. Doesn't make any difference. He's from Baltimore, and he said when I ninety five opens up, this was about nineteen seventy three or four. He said this place is gonna boom, and he was right. All 
Arvada is the name of, uh, taken from the initials of <coughs> its founder, Arthur Vining Davis. He, he had been one of the founders of the Aluminum Corporation of America, or Alcoa. And I, he cashed out of um, Alcoa, and like a lot of wealthy people, he got involved in doing things, and he started acquiring Florida real estate. And he bought it relative, very cheap, his basis in it, Tom Workman can tell you how frightening that is when you sell it, when you have that low basis. And as Jim had mentioned earlier, in Boca Raton, we were very, very fortunate that you didn't have this hodgepodge strip development with a shell store and a duplex and all up and down Federal Highway. That Arvida land banked all this property till it was appropriate to develop in a master plan and act in planned manner. And the Penn Central Railroad went into bankruptcy. And you say, what in the world would the Penn Central Railroad have anything to do with Boca Raton, Florida? We barely had a railroad here. Penn Central barred Arvida in order that they could use all their loss carry forwards against the, that tremendous lurking gain that lay in that property that Arvida owned through Arthur Vining Davis. Ar <clears throat> Arvida was actually the incorporation of Arthur Vining Davis's estate so that they could sell stock to the public so there'd be liquidity in Mr. Davis's estate when he passed away. He was elderly when he was doing a lot of this in Florida. And rather than have to have a fire sale of his land, uh, they could take this cash from the sale of the stock and utilize it to pay his estate tax liability. And one of the people that was brought here to be the first president of Arvida was Milt Weir Sr. And the Weir family is iconic in Boca Raton. They ended up developing Royal Palm when they were running Arvida. Then they did Camino Gardens on their own when it unfortunately transitioned from Africa, USA to a subdivision, much to the regret of all children in the area. <laughs> and then they did some other things. But that is what... Uh, that is the story, as I understand it, behind Arvida. As soon as they used up their lost carry forwards, they sold it. And that's when the leverage buyout was done by all the executives at Arvida. In addition to Chuck Cobb and Bill Shubin, uh, John Temple was the president of Arvida at the time. Cobb was the chairman of the board, and then Bill was the executive vice president, commercial. And he, he was the father of Town Center Mall, moving the center of town to the mall for every person around. It's great sitting next to Remy. I'm trying to read his notes. <laughs> it's like back in high school, you know, he's, he's, you know scoping off his notes. But yeah, that's um, for sure. The, the the Arvida guys at that time, um, they uh, they cut a, a wide path through the town. Very well respected, uh, generally speaking, and um, they had some really smart guys that. Uh, that obviously knew how knew where they were going and what they wanted to do, and uh, I, I do remember when they bought the Boca Raton Hotel. Nobody can figure out why these guys buy this Boca Hotel. I mean, stodgy old place. It closed in closed in May and it opened up again, I guess, in late October, and uh, it went from a, I wouldn't even say a convention hotel. It was a more of a winter retreat for people that could afford to stay there. And uh, among the many other things that Arvida did, they turned it into probably one of the more important uh, convention hotels, certainly in Florida. And uh, you know they grew it, and, and you know here it is today, still still kicking. And another super wealthy guy has bought it, <laughs> so uh, they they knew what they were doing, and, and certainly again were probably a single key factor of, of making Boca what it is today. I would say. Now I where'd Patricia go? <laughs> um, well, on that note, I was going to if we just do it this way. Talk about the hotel, because yes indeed, our Vita built that thing, the tower. <laughs> Sorry, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> and but it really revolutionized the hotel in a way, the community, uh, because this is that time period when the hotel, and I, I am the unofficial historian for the hotel, by the way, um, 
morphed from this social hotel, like he said, open part of the year to a full-time convention hotel, which obviously a modern hotel has to do to survive. But unfortunately, they built the tower in the very nicest part of the Meisner, the cloister in yes. the original part, rather than 10 feet away. But I wasn't there, so they didn't ask me. Um, how, how, how about the hotel in that era? This, how did it influence the community? Was there any interaction? Was it completely separate? Um, I mean, how did that change uh, the community? Well, that's just about the time we came here. I, I honestly don't remember. I probably drove by and watched the construction. I don't remember that, but uh, it was, it certainly couldn't be built again. I'm quite sure of that. Uh, they, uh, they, they got the right time and they got the right counsel to get that th thing through. Personally, I like the building. I think it's, it's unique and it's, uh, um, it's a landmark for the, for the city. Um, and one that just recently, as if anybody has been over there, they just painted it. Uh, it is supposed to be a pink, according to Michael Glennie, who was the general manager. It looks, they call it coastal, coastal something or other pink, which is almost white, to tell you the truth. But it looks good. <clears throat> the one thing that the tower did is give a lot of boys jobs for the summer. I remember the summer that we all built the seawall that never worked in Delray Beach. Friends of mine worked on the tower in the summer of 66. It wasn't finished that year, but it, it took a while to, to develop. And the hotel, Susan had asked, what interaction did it have or increase? I don't know that Arvida's acquisition of it from the Chines is what caused it, but certainly they shared it uh, with at least Seacrest High School because we were just terribly fortunate growing up here to have our prom, not in some decorated gymnasium or Howard Johnson's, but we had it at the main dining room at the Boca Raton Hotel and Club, and that was very unique. Um, and then in the summer, they would um, have the, the old Cabana Club, which is where the Addison is now. It was a grand facility made out of wood, and, uh, had a pool, and it had a high dive with no uh, insurance limitation restriction. <laughs> you could go up there and dive off of it. And so all of us nickel millionaires would join for the summer and in, and enjoy the pool and the cabanas and the, and the beach there. So that's another way they interacted with the, with the locals. Yeah, I was going to comment the same way that, uh, that Royal Palm, uh, we used to have many, with Teen Town used to have events in Royal Palm and the Yacht Club. And uh, we all had our proms at the Boca Hotel and and uh, Arvida, I think, was a very user-friendly to the community, for sure. Um, honestly, I don't really remember the tower being built. It must have been in the period that I, yeah. I had left. I, don't, I really don't remember it. You uh, said it was 66? That it's, summer. That's when they started it. About it's 69. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's uh, when they finished that scale. Yeah. yeah. January 31st. It took years to build. Yeah, I just, honestly, I just don't remember <laughs> it, you know. And, and, and frankly, uh, I think I only went uh, up to the top at dinner maybe once or twice, and I don't think I've ever been to any other floors, but it's, uh, you know, I, we look at it from our backyard, and I think it looks pretty nice, but uh, that's just me. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, I will say, just an aside, a, a story, because I alluded to the 60s, you know, where I did a lot of misdeeds. One of our mutual classmates, his dad was the manager of Brad Leggett. And uh, when they'd close up the hotel in the summertime, and literally, they boarded it up. You could go in there and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. <laughs> and they'd pull those beautiful carpets up and all the furniture would go away. And uh, of course, we had the keys to the castle. And we go in there with our bikes, our, our bicycles, with a flashlight strapped to our head, and we play <laughs> Capture the Flag. And we have these things. We'd literally stay in that place all day. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd hide a flag in the swimming pool under the auditorium. And, and I mean, we just literally spent days in that place in the summertime. And uh, I'm sure Mr. Lego would have appreciated it, but we had a heck of a good time. <laughs> Thank you.
The Cabana Club, by the way, was $125 to join for the summer. I think it was May 1st to probably September 30th. And you had to be interviewed by Mrs. Frida Ferber. And she was real serious about this interview. You have to go in and sit, tell her where you came from, what you were doing, and what you, anyway, uh, it was an interesting time and it was a wonderful place for our kids to go. <coughs> yeah, I've, I've heard many wonderful memories of people's time at the Cabana Club. Um, well, so speaking of the beach, uh, this is an era when condominiums started springing up like mushrooms, they did in the 60s, uh, particularly south of the inlet and Sable Point and so on, and there was a little kickback there uh, starting in the 60s. So tell us about the rise of the condominium and beachfront in Boca Raton. Well, at the, I, I believe uh, I, there's a place called the Boca, uh, I can't remember the name, it was, a, it was a rental property, got converted to a condominium in the, in the 70s, but essentially the first condo that I can recall being built out there in the center part of the city was Boca, um, Boca Point, uh, I'm sorry, Boca Point. Point. Mm -hmm. Sable Point, Sable Point, Sable Point. Sable Point. Sable Point. yeah, and then came Sable Ridge and Sable Shores, and yeah. then <clears throat> you got the uh, two uh, Radis buildings to the south, the Del Mars, Boca Del Mar, and Bo uh, Del, um, doesn't make any difference. Anyway, they, uh, they built a bunch of them, and a lot of them, and, and as Remy said earlier, the, the prices were, relatively speaking to today's values, bargains. But in those days, that's what the market was. You know, you, you pay what the market is at, at whatever point in time that, that, you, that you buy it. Uh, anyway, they, they constructed them all. They, they basically, the city bought all that property, essentially everything on the ocean, from Palmetto Park North, from the Shines and some other folks, I believe, all the way up to, uh, there's a place called La Fantana. There's a couple of other condominiums on the ocean. Al Petrozelli's office is up still on the hill, on the, uh, just at the top of the crest, which would probably never be built again, ever. Uh, you've, I'm sure, are familiar with this house as they've talked. They've been trying to get past several lots north of his ha his property that's been in the courts and back and forth for months and years. And then there was uh, San Remo and, and um, Boca Bath and and, uh, and then the, the park and then 40th Street. And of course, before, there was no bridge there until about 1980 or thereabouts. 60s, 60s I think. No, that, that 40th yeah. Street bridge was yeah. in yeah. I think I thought it was later than that. It was after we came here, so okay. it had to be in the late seventies, I think. Anyway, that's all. Oh, oh, down. oh down. sorry, wrong way. Yep. I don't remember the chronology, but they termed it uh, potentially the concrete curtain that would wall off the citizens from the ocean, and seeing what had been done by Arvada with the with the sables, the ones that Jim mentioned, the, the first three condos there, and then the evolution of development south of the inlet, the community gathered together and uh, passed a bond issue in order to buy the beachfront property. Susan was correcting me when we were talking earlier before the meeting that the Shines had owned today what is Red Reef Park. And that was, I guess, the initial acquisition, which was a huge, huge bond issue. It was like $18 million, uh, which was just beyond belief at the time that they do it. And the city ended up creating the, or <clears throat> in conjunction with the uh, state, the Greater Boca Beach Tax District in order to generate, which went outside the city of Boca Raton, which we have today. Uh, with a separate governing board and separate legal entity. And that was necessary in order to generate enough tax revenue to pay off the bond issue. And we're all the benefactors of it today that have this wonderful, extensive beach that's available to the public here that no other community would enjoy something like that. So they were very foresighted in doing that and precluding the concrete curtain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looking at this picture, I think 
the smaller building, I think, was one of the first uh, condos built on the beach. Uh, uh, Dave Rixey, who was a tennis pro at Boca West, I believe his father um, developed that building, if my memory serves me right. Uh, yeah, the, the condominiums uh, for when I came back to town as a stockbroker, it was like uh, uncharted territory because these were all new people. They didn't uh, they didn't have brokerage accounts and they needed to get their securities registered in the state of Florida for tax reasons. And it was a coal calling holiday. I mean, we spent <laughs> you know we'd be there till till late in the night. And, but then funny thing in the summer they weren't there. So it was a, it, you had a brief period of time to, to tap into that, but uh, for sure that uh, that opened the door for uh, seasonal uh, residents and what's the Remy like uh, six months of a day to live in Florida mm -hmm. to, to qualify and, and that certainly saved thousands of people, millions and millions of dollars of, of uh, claiming Florida as their residence. Um, I remember when they when they did the beach. Uh, uh, acquisition. There was a, a restaurant and whatnot burned down. Where the little par three golf courses. Yes. There was a sun and, yep. sun and surf. The ocean heart. Ocean, ocean, ocean heart. Yeah. Ocean heart. <laughs> oh, you're right. Ocean heart. Right. It was really the sun and surf club. I, I remember when my parents. Uh, we lived off of uh, Fifth Avenue on yeah. Main Street, and we could hear all this commotion one night and. We looked over on the horizon, it was a big glow, and the place was on fire. And we all went over there and watched that place burn down. So that was a harbor of things to come that yes. uh, it never got into public ha or private hands, I guess, again after that. Mm -hmm. sat, sat for a long time, just a foundation, and somehow or other became a part of that massive uh, uh, you know, purchase. I, I do have one regret. I, I, I go to work every day, I drive up A1A. And I go over the Inlet Bridge, and I look where the the Beach Club is now, and kind of remember where the old Inlet Bridge was. And uh, there was a great, um, I won't call it a sand dune because it was just the opposite, but it was really kind of a bowl. And we used to have some great parties in that bowl. <laughs> so yeah. I, every time I go over that bridge, I said, "Man, that was that was a lot of fun." Is that the infamous pig pen that you're talking about? Um, I'm not sure. We we used to we used to get it on both sides of the end oh, okay. and uh, <laughs> yeah, where the little yeah. private school was. We'd camp out there on the weekends, and uh, but uh, yeah, those are gr those are great days. But you know, acquiring the beach again was uh, another feather in the cap of, of the leaders of the city for sure. And what Buzz was just talking about for years, I, I don't think it's still there, but the steps going down from the ocean heart to the sea to the sand was still there. And when you went up there, you could see it all the time. And I think one of my children said that that's not there, but you know, up until the this century, you could still see it. Uh, a few years ago, Carrie Cohen asked me to do research on all the restaurants we've had on the beach, and they all met an untimely end. Yes. And I said, I see this as a sign from the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> now, I regret that there's no place to take, you know, your out of town guests yeah. to a nice restaurant on the beach. But nonetheless, yeah, they all burned or got hit by a hurricane or in the case of this one, both. So speaking of really sexy places, the Boca Mall, I'm its only defender. Um, and I'm told by certain people that it was wonderful it when it was, came to town. Uh, and of course, today it's my Super Park. So tell us a little bit about what you remember about the Boca Mall and how cool it was, Jim. <laughs> there was a movie theater, I remember that. And uh, there was a guy named Bill Weeks who had a, uh, called uh, Weeks Family Shoe Store or something like that. He was a nice guy from Del Rey, I believe. And I don't know whatever happened to him, but he was in there. He's been, um, I, there was Brits and, and um, Jefferson's, Jefferson's, that's right. And uh, a few others. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, it was, uh, you know, for what it was at that point, it was, it was fine. I, obviously, I think what they've done with it is pretty, pretty famous now, uh, relatively speaking, I guess. The 
one thing is it, it was somewhat haunted from the inception because part of the parking was designed on the roof and from the uh, first day on it appeared it was shut down for safety reasons and I don't think ever returned to use. Uh, there was a store in there, might have been called Steering Wheel or something like that, that was owned by a gentleman named Vald Speckes. And in order to cause him, he might have had several other stores in the Boca Mall too. In order to get him to leave, he got promised the opportunity to open a store in Meisner Park which was much enjoyed by all of us. It was called Liberties. He opened that bookstore there that everybody liked. Um, George Smathers, our US Senator from 48, when he beat Claude Pepper till 68, was one of, that was one of his investments. And I think probably one of his only less than stellar investments. It was a fine place, fun to go to. They had a Bavarian colony in there, I remember. Mm -hmm. it, we didn't have that in Boca or Delray up until then. Uh, probably in the direction Boca Raton was going when it first opened, a Brits and Jefferson was not the anchors that was going to bring in all of the, all of the locals. Uh, but it served a purpose and was a great place to, I guess, for people to go to for a while. And then we <clears throat> came up with the grand idea of creating Meisner Park and we all enjoy that now. You know, I was trying to find a, a place that I would mention this, but uh, I suppose this is as good as any. It, it was interesting when I read, uh, like on the old Boca websites, when I see people write about the good old days and how great Boca was, and boy, we really miss that. Um, as a kid growing up, when I needed braces, we had to go to the orthodontist in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, if you wanted to go to the movies, you went to the Gateway in Fort Lauderdale. If you wanted to go to dinner, you went to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, if you wanted to go shop, you went to Birdines in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Rodman's was, or Rodman's, was, Rodman's was, was, was fine, but you know, that didn't quite cut it when you were about 16, 17 years old. And really, the, when the Boca Mall opened was really that first time that you really didn't need to go to Fort Lauderdale. You could find something here. And then, of course, you know, all the other growth that came. But for a long period of time, if you wanted to do anything, you went to Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> Or West Palm. Yeah. I don't think our, our car never went uphill. We always went downhill. <laughs> Buzz, there were probably only six traffic lights between Fort Lauderdale. That's true. It was, uh, I know Susan's going to mention I 95. Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump into a side story. Uh, when you wanted to get to 95, which I think stopped at Copens Road, uh, when they first built it, stopped somewhere just south, south of Pompano. Mm -hmm. To get to 95, the, the back roads that we invented, I mean, you take, <laughs> you take power line, you take, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just crazy. You always figured out a faster way to get to I-95. And, and uh, the other day we were driving around Lighthouse Point and, and I remember sometimes you wanted to avoid Federal Highway, you went down uh, this road that went through Deerfield and on down through Lighthouse Point. The key thing was avoid the stoplight. <laughs> oh, I have. Let's go the other way. There you see the future Boca Mall. This photo was taken in 1970. You can see um, the Royal Palm Plaza, now Royal Palm Place, US 1 in Dixie. You should have bought then, right, Jim? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so uh, last, I do want to talk about that. <laughs> so I lived through that. I'm a Broward County gal. And Boca, the, actually it's the part of North Fort Lauderdale Pompano was sort of the last stretch of uh, um, uh, 95 to be completed. When I was a little girl, they were working on it in Miami. <laughs> but uh, we didn't want to finish the interstate because supposedly we wanted to pay for the turnpike. That's what I've always heard, right? Which, guess what? We're still paying for it. We're still paying for it. Yes. Uh, but the stretch through Boca was finished in uh, 75, and finally 95 is finished in 76. So 
This is the Glades Interchange, and guess what? We're doing it all over again right now. And I know, I don't know about you, but I do everything to avoid that interchange <laughs> or getting on and off there. Um, I'd rather get off at Yamato or Boat or Palmetto or whatever. Um, anyway, talk a little bit about the interstate. We talked, we touched on it and how much it changed the community here. Well, I think I mentioned earlier, I met uh, Hunter Moss, who was the developer of this. He and his partner developed the Inner Harbor in, ba in Baltimore and a lot of other, uh, the surf side, that thing down in Miami, I can't think of, it starts with an S. Anyway, they were big time developers and he told me in 1973 or four, when I met him, he said, when this opens up, it's going to boom, they're going to come out of Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and they did, uh, and Arvida was ready for them. And uh, this place boomed. Uh, I don't remember. I remember driving on 95 before it was open. I used to play, uh, occasionally play golf down at Deer Creek uh, on Hillsboro Boulevard, and you could sneak on 95 mm -hmm. before it was open yeah. and drive up and get off at Palmetto or Blaze, I forget which, probably from Palmetto because that's where we live. Um, and that was an adventure itself. It kind of spooky. It luckily, never no got no, never got stopped. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thankfully. No traffic. <laughs> no traffic. <clears throat> As Jim said, I-95 just opened up the entire community. You could live in Boca, drive to Miami, and work, and come back. Allegedly, where it really showed itself first is that um, there was a piece from Palm Beach Gardens to Okeechobee Road in West Palm, and that part it didn't go south of there. And of course, the reason for that is that uh, John D. MacArthur was trying to develop Palm Beach Gardens, and so just magically, somehow, he got that piece of I-95 developed first, so everyone could work in downtown West Palm Beach or over in Palm Beach and get out to his new homes. We finished the exchange in 75, but again, it didn't go all the way through. I can't remember the exact time, but my wife was working at the 4th District Court of Appeal. She was still driving her graduation present from law school, a MGB GT, unair conditioned. Oh. So <clears throat> she would tell me every day how long it took to go to a certain point on 95 in West Palm, get off, and as Buzz said, snake around somewhere to get back on a piece that would take you down south. And it was a glorious day when it was finished all the way through. One of the interesting things was the road system in, in Boca West, because for a long time, Military Trail ended at Glades Road. You could get at Atlantic Avenue and Delray, look south, and you could see the stop sign at Glades, and that's all you'd see. You could drive all that way. It was all black, and that light was there. And, and Palmetto Park Road ended somewhere like at Military uh, later, when the YMCA opened, we'd go out there to play racquetball or take the children out there to swim and things. You couldn't get there from here. You had to go to military and then somehow snake through Boca del Mar to get to the Y, because that piece from military west to uh, power line was one of the last pieces that came in very late, like I, perhaps in the 80s. And then at one point, you had to go out, there was no, no you had to go to the Camino and then Camino angled to Paradise Palms, didn't it? And, yeah. and then you could snake through there to get to Military Trail, I think, if you wanted to go north. It, it was really odd, but it, you could also get away from people if they were after you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, to get onto the turnpike, it was a, quite an adventure. Um, my only story of, of I-95, again, following my dad, he was uh, must have decided he needed some exercise, so he started riding a bicycle. And uh, he'd go out and ride on I-95 oh, from, wow. <laughs> from uh, like where Yamato would be north to Del Rey. Obviously, it wasn't open. Yeah. And uh, one day he didn't come back and didn't come back, and all those that knew my mother, uh, she was a world-class worry ward. So she's worrying, you know, where's Howard and this and that, and he didn't come. So finally, it's getting near dark, and here he comes walking, carrying his bicycle. Oh. And he, <laughs> he hit a rock and gotten thrown off his bicycle and broke his wrist. Oh. So that was the end of riding a bicycle in 995. <laughs> but uh, for sure, 
uh, those uh, that have seen the new interchange, it, it's really going to be quite spectacular and allegedly it's going to be a lot better. Uh, those that have driven south on I-95 now, um, they have the express lanes. And somewhere in that express lane, there's something, I haven't seen it in lights, but it says, you can drive as fast as you want. <laughs> now, if you're not going 85, you're going to get run over. But uh, as you know, here it was built as one of the most fabulous uh, expressways, and now they're widening up to six and eight lanes almost all the way to Miami. So um, hold on, there's more coming. So we're going to be here in droves. As the lawyers like to say, buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, do we have any um, comments that you guys would like to make, or do we have any questions from the audience that you might like to ask one of our panelists? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. When was the, uh, I was thinking about the vote at this time. Who made the decision and how did they, who owned the land where the present law is? Where was that transition from the old vote law? Can't hear she she's asked the town center mall or yeah. uh, no, 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 no. not Meisner Park. You're not talking about Meisner Park. No, 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 no. Well, oh, the old mall. The old, the old mall was where Meisner Park was. Right, but who made that decision and, and who sold who? that land? And, and who did it? Oh, yeah. Town center. It, it, two, two, you're talking two, about two different two, places. Town center is west of the interstate. Right. Used to be bus park. Right. Right. Is that what you're talking about? Right, in other words, that, that was just like oh, yes. originally that was owned by people and who yes. made that decision. Right, okay. And, and who accepted that decision? Oh, okay. She's, she's asking about the t yeah, town center mall and how that came to be. Well, all that property was owned by Arvida. They developed that property. Uh, it's owned by si Siemens, Simons now, oh, I believe. <clears throat> but they built the town center and. Uh, and all the ancillary things around it, all that re retail stuff, there's restaurants, as you know, and a lot of um, residential stuff. Um, and they did that, well, I guess, in the, in the age, 79, 80, the eight, early 80s, yeah. or thereabouts. That's right. That was in the county at the time, and so it was a lot easier to develop. But it was all owned by Arvita, and it was part of the Butts Farm acquisition, I believe, is that piece. Bill Shubin was the quarterback, the uh, coordinator, the director. He was our vice president commercial at the time. And he made it possible for the opening of the mall and, and Burdines for the Historical Society to be the benefactor of that opening. So it was very fortunate and really wonderful. He was a very active uh, supporter of the Historical Society the whole time they were here. They're still in Boca, still have their house there, the Shubans, but they spend most of their time in uh, Idaho now. Were the people uh, accepting of that? Because it really did change the dynamics of the town. Oh, yeah. Well, the purpose of Arvida actually was to move the center of town to the mall, and I would say to a large degree it, it did, yes. They moved their offices from right there um, at the corner of Federal Highway and Camino, 998 South Federal, from there out to the town center. Uh, in that standalone building adjacent to the mall, but that was in the county at the time. I mean, that was that was pretty far west. Anything else? Yes. Yes, my father-in-law was a professor, I believe, at CW Post in Long Island, and one of his good friends came down to be, I think, one of the first presidents at FAU, and called him and said, "Why don't you come down and be one of my vice presidents in Boca Raton?" And he said, Boca Raton, absolutely not. And his wife said, Boca Raton, absolutely. Uh. <laughs> so they were one of the first homes, I think, in Royal Palm. Um, wow. And they, it, it was interesting because they belonged to the, the resort. They run like wild, kids ran like wild all over the you know, tower. And they belonged to the, the, the beach club, the Cabana Beach Club. And the Cabana Boy would go in and chase the rats out. You know, where they, they went in. <laughs> and there was a group of families that want to stay in Royal Palm where they lived that um, they just there's very tight group and they drank scotch and they smoked cigarettes and they played poker and they had lots of kids and they lived into their nineties. I mean it was a party. I'm like, how did you grab it from us? 
Fantastic. Said good boat for living. Good. Uh-huh. I, I have a question. Yeah. What restaurants do you remember along Federal Highway that you went to? Is I remember Lums. <laughs> yes. Lums. Lums. Do you Lums. remember any of the Rats? Ranch House. Rats. I remember Rizzo's. Rizzo's. That's a old one. Rizzo's. 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 The Bayou. Browns. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jim, give me the microphone a second. We had a program called Foods of the 70s. Yes. Was one of our eight times? Okay. Yeah. Well, we, we, I have a PowerPoint, and it's hilarious because it has all the restaurants from the 70s. And by 79, there were 165 restaurants in Boca Raton. My God. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did we need those? I don't know. But that includes Burger King and KFC. Well, still. Uh, but um, it's boring. kind of fun to look. There's just a handful that are still around. Um, but yeah, I, I never heard of Rizzo's, and there you go. So um, sometime you can take a look at my, my PowerPoint. It was a lot of fun doing that research. Um, anyway, let's round it up. Uh, thank you all for coming. I want to thank uh, thank you for our panelists. Hey, Susan. One thing that we have to talk about if you talk about the 70s is the most unique day ever in Boca Raton. And it was 19 January 1977. Oh, yeah. And you know what happened that day? I do know. That was the day it snowed. (laughs) Now, I have to to divulge just for a little bit. Buzz has got one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. he lived over, his parents lived over a little behind Meisner Park in a subdivision over there called Bermuda Square. It was a couple of blocks, I believe. And um, they had, he had friends, as he called them, the marauders. And there was a street, there was a, there was a house down the street that during the summer was never occupied. It happened to have a boat slip underneath the house. It was on the intercoastal, and I'm going to let Buzz tell the rest of the story because it's hilarious. Well, actually, it was just the boathouse. I think the story was the house was torn down in a hurricane in the 20s, I believe. And there were just three walls of this boathouse that uh, Greg Talbot Talbot ended up building a beautiful house there. And uh, Maureen will remember the Weeks family lived across the street from us. And uh, they were troublemakers. I was actually pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we had the brilliant idea to go down there in that boathouse at night. And back in the day, uh, there were a lot of fishermen used to fish off the Palmetto Park Bridge. And they, uh, I guess there were fish, but there were an awful lot of people there fishing. So we had a brilliant idea to go down to this boathouse with a trumpet, trombone, whatever. And oh. we, we'd get into that uh, boathouse and blow the horn, <laughs> the, the, you know, the musical instrument horn three times. And Shorty would drop the gates, the bridge would go yeah, up. Yeah. And, oh. and, <laughs> And nothing, nothing would come, and the bridge would go down. The guys would put their thing in the water, and we'd blow it again. We thought this was great, great fun, really, really fun. So we did this off and on for a long time. And uh, one night we're there, and, and, and we're blowing the horn. Nothing, nothing, nothing happens. We blow the horn again. Nothing happens. Bridge doesn't go up. And with that, the headlights come on. And it was our Boca police. <laughs> and I, I don't remember whether it was Jodery or somebody, uh, Joe jo- Jodery's dad. It was but, Brownie, you told me. Well, so, so we jumped in the water. <laughs> so we jumped in the water and we swam across the intercoastal. And that was pretty good, except we ended up basically in uh, Chief Brown's uh, yard. <laughs> So he uh, corralled us all, and uh, I think he probably thought it was pretty funny. But uh, he made us walk across the bridge, and we had to apologize to Shorty, and apologize to all the fishermen, and that was the end of our trombone. Uh, Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm so sorry you're I got in trouble with that. Well, let's have a round of applause for our.
Thank you so much for coming tonight. We hope we'll see you at the succeeding uh, town hall. It's going to be a gonna be great season, and uh, we appreciate you all coming. Thank you.